I am an atheist. I don't believe that any gods exist. I used to believe in the Christian God, but that stopped when I realized I hadn't observed anything that had actually convinced me. It was just an assumption that I had been raised with. So what would convince me that a god exists, such as the god of Christianity? Well, many atheists will say that some kind of miracle would convince them. Doug from the channel Pine Creek, for example, often proposes a challenge where he asks Christians to pray to God to light a wet napkin on fire, mirroring what the prophet Elijah was able to do in 1 Kings 18. Doug explains that he would be convinced by this miracle for the following reason. Why would these particular things convince you that God exists? Okay, I said, <laughs> I'll answer it, Trent, because it's amazing. It's cool. It's something that you haven't and I haven't ever, ever seen before. And it would convince me that the natural physical laws sometimes don't work. Doug says that his napkin challenge would convince him because it would show that the natural laws sometimes don't work. But I don't think that's why this miracle would convince him. We already know that the natural laws sometimes don't work. Our current understanding of physics cannot explain some of the things we observe. Our physical laws do not always work, but this doesn't motivate us to believe in God. It motivates us to do more physics. Clearly, atheists are not going to be convinced that God exists simply because sometimes the natural laws don't work. That's already happening. In fact, I think that Trent Horn, the apologist Doug was responding to, made a good point about this. I would ask the non-believers who offer these examples, why would these particular things convince you that God exists? I suspect ultimately this is the reasoning. I don't know what caused a limb to be healed, or the stars to move, or the napkin to catch fire. I can't imagine a natural cause. Therefore, God must have done it. In other words, they commit the God of the gaps fallacy in their hypothetical evidence. I don't know what caused X. Therefore, God exists. I think that Trent Horn is correct when he says that miracles, by themselves, are God of the gaps reasoning. Just because we can't explain something, that doesn't mean it was caused by a god. If you could prove to Doug that the natural laws sometimes don't work, that would not entail any specific explanation, much less a god of some kind. Believing in God because sometimes the natural laws don't work is God of the Gaps reasoning. And that brings us to the title of this video. What is the difference between God of the Gaps and convincing miracles? Is there a difference at all? I think there is, and I think both Doug and Trent are failing to understand what that difference is. Despite my earlier criticism of Doug, I do think that the napkin challenge would be decent evidence for some kind of God, not because it's a violation of the natural laws, but because, and this is the key difference, it would publicly indicate a new kind of unseen intelligence. That, I think, is the key to these conversations. We all agree that there are unknown forces at work in the world, which is why physics is still an ongoing field of study. This fact is unremarkable to both atheists and theists. The question that we are interested in, the question that theism hinges on, is whether or not any of these unknown forces are the products of novel, unseen intelligent agents. This, I think, is what both sides are actually concerned about, this is what both Doug and Trent are missing, and this is the key difference between God of the Gaps and convincing miracles. Does the miracle clearly indicate some kind of unseen intelligent agent, like a god? That is what needs to be demonstrated. So, how could an apologist demonstrate the existence of an unseen intelligent agent? How could anyone demonstrate the existence of an unseen intelligent agent without it being God of the Gaps reasoning? Well, I think the best way would be through language, and ideally through two-way communication, in such a way that it could not simply be another human on the other end. I think that's a pretty reasonable standard for inferring a novel, unseen intelligence, and that's why I think Doug's napkin challenge, if met, would be decent reason to believe in a novel, unseen intelligent agent. It would represent a relatively clear case of sending a message and getting a response. 
assuming, of course, that the response was reasonably consistent and publicly witnessed, not just a one-time private case of, whoa, that was kind of weird. Language, and or communication, is how you demonstrate that there is an unseen intelligence out there, and it's how you go from God of the Gaps to a convincing miracle. So that's what I think the difference is between God of the Gaps and convincing miracles. However, proving the existence of some generic, non-specific unseen intelligence is one thing. Narrowing it down to a god of some kind is quite another. After all, an unseen intelligent agent could, in many cases, just be another human using some novel kind of technology or an unknown trick, as is often the case. Less likely, and requiring more evidence, would be some kind of alien, although we do at least know that physics and chemistry permit their existence in theory. Less likely still, and requiring even more evidence, would be some kind of supernatural, trans-dimensional god-being who doesn't fit into any known category of life. Suffice it to say, when you hear hoofbeats, you think horses, not zebras. When you hear prime numbers from space, you think aliens, not Jesus. So what would convince me that an unseen intelligence is not simply another human, or even an intelligent alien, but some kind of god, or even the Christian god specifically? And how could I be reasonably sure that his existence wasn't simply a delusion or a memory distortion? I have to admit that my answer to this question is not 100% clear, but I think I can at least establish a reasonable minimum standard with a thought experiment. Imagine that you had a long-lost father, and this man wanted to reconnect with you and be part of your life. But also, he claimed he was a centaur, a half-human, half-horse, something you don't already believe in and whose very existence seems very implausible. What would it take to convince you that your long-lost centaur father actually existed? Seriously, think about this. Would you be convinced by a letter in the mail written by an anonymous author who claims to have touched your father's centaur body? Would you be convinced by some vague invitation to search your feelings for the horse part of yourself? I don't think so, and this is fundamentally why neither the Bible nor Christians' claimed emotional experiences have convinced me of God's existence. So what would convince you that your centaur father actually exists? Well, you'd probably want some kind of in-person introduction to see and feel that he is indeed a person and a centaur. That should be entirely doable if he's actually real. Of course, it's still possible that a single experience like this could be some kind of mistaken dream or memory distortion, so it would certainly help if your centaur father appeared repeatedly and in a public setting, which reduces the chances of it being a delusion or a memory distortion. This, I'd say, is what it would take to convince me that my centaur father actually exists. In a very similar way, going back once again to the topic of the Christian God, I think I would be convinced if he actually introduced himself to me, like the person he's supposed to be, in a public or semi-public setting like I'd expect of my centaur father. Introducing yourself is typically how you meet new people, especially if these people are some kind of novel creatures that you don't already believe in. If that's the standard we would set for believing in a simple centaur, then I think that's the least we can ask for when it comes to believing in a god. I would expect a personal god to at least clearly introduce himself to me in person in this way. Have you even tried asking her out? Or talking to her? Or even entering her field of vision? So, has God clearly introduced himself to me in at least the way I would expect of my centaur father? Has God introduced himself this way to anyone recently? It honestly doesn't seem so. Now, of course, many people do claim to have had direct contact with the Christian God. But then again, many other people claim direct contact with other, mutually exclusive gods, so it seems to me that this kind of private revelation is not a reliable way to determine if a god exists, nor for a real god to communicate with us if it really wanted to. This gets back to what I said about delusions and memory distortions. For something like a god or even just a centaur, you really should expect something public and concrete. Despite the claim that god is powerful and personal and wants a relationship with us, 
God does not clearly introduce himself like an actual person, nor does he do anything to show us that he really is this kind of novel entity. The personal God of Christianity does not act like a real person. He acts like a hot young woman on the internet who is inexplicably infatuated with you. Yeah, baby, I'm totally real. But we can't meet in person. Here's my untraceable email address and a bunch of contradictory things I've privately told other people. Not very convincing. I, I think in order for me to believe in God and still be me, um, I, I think the whole, it, it wouldn't have to be, it would have to be more than just one experience like that. The, the whole structure of the world that we live in would have to be different. There, there's this video game I played when I was a kid, and in the, in the mythology of this video game, there was a god, uh, and you play a character in the game, but, but this god is just all around, interacting with everyone all the time, like moving things, visible, you know, the, the, it's just everyone with every, anyone could talk to this God anytime that they wanted. This God was just in everyone's life in tangible ways, mo multiple different kinds of tangible ways, sometimes sounds, sometimes moving things, sometimes, you know, but if we lived in a world where God was just a regular part of our lives, like anybody else, like our parents or our pets or the, you know, then then yeah, that would be, it would be really, really, really hard. Then you would be irrational to walk around denying the existence of, of God. But we don't live yeah. in that world. We live in a world where we, we don't have these experiences and, and we're forced to interpret very normal, benign experiences in a theistic way. This is fundamentally why I don't believe that such a God is likely to exist. Not only is there no clear indication of an unseen intelligent agent of any kind, there is also no indication that such an agent would be some kind of god being. So, to recap, I think the question we are really trying to explore in the atheism-theism debate is not whether or not there are things we can't explain, but rather whether or not there is some unseen intelligence at work around us, and if so, what kind of being it is. Unfortunately for theists, even by the standard we would set for something as simple as a centaur, there doesn't appear to be any good indication that such an unseen intelligence, much less one like the Christian God, actually exists.